Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> you want to start by telling the audience how we know each other? Uh, yeah, I would love to. Um, you and I, Lucy Fink, we go back, way back. I want to say like 2016. I was working at a big agency. We were doing a very, uh, our very first influencer campaign for Under Armour. And I was like, you know who we need? We need Lucy Fink. <laughs> we need someone who's just going to like connect with a consumer to really talk about our brand. And you were just like, you were the shit. And from there, it was like, we reached out to you. You were down. We had a great partnership. And since then, we've been friends. We've been IG friends. We've been following each other's children, stories, lives. Like, it's been fantastic. I'm really, I'm glad that we've kept in touch. Same. And that Under Armour partnership was definitely my first big long-term brand deal. And, you know, there were, tons of perks we got to go to baltimore it was awesome. visit the headquarters it gave me kind of a nice blueprint of what brand deals could be as i was planning for this episode you actually came to my mind and then simultaneously you applied on the form we manifested each other <laughs> yes i was thinking of you and then i saw your name and i'm so happy you reached out and i'm i me think too. you have a really interesting story with probably so many more details than you've ever posted yeah. in public on social media. Yeah. yeah. I want to dive in first to your whole coming out story. I don't know if I ever heard this. I would say like public facing, I came out pretty late. Um, I had a boyfriend all in college. Um, and then out of college, I also had a boyfriend for like a year and a half. Um, and it was very much like, like being gay when I was in high school and college wasn't like what it is to be gay now. Like, I feel like there's so much community. There's so much acceptance. There's so much where you like turn on the TV and you can like see yourself. You can hear a story that is something you relate to. I just didn't have that growing up. And so all of high school, like I knew I was different, but I just didn't explore it. And when I was in college, my I literally had a boyfriend all of college. So I remember being like, okay, I'm definitely into girls and I definitely want to explore this. But I also like my best friend was my boyfriend. So it was like, I was very uncomfortable with it. It was very much like an internal struggle. And especially as like a very feminine presenting lesbian, like it was really easy to just like fly under the radar. Um, so it wasn't until I was in my early 20s where I was living in New York. I was like, fuck it. I just like want to be me and like feel whole. And I went on Tinder. And I just started like dating a bunch of girls. And that's when I felt like, oh my God, like this is what I want to do. This is who I want to be. And then fast forward to um, meeting my now wife. Um, we also met on Tinder uh, and we've been married for five years. But yeah, I guess like the formal coming out, it wasn't like I was like, mom and dad, I'm gay. I was like, hey guys, um, I am dating girls. I remember with my mom, it was like an ex-girlfriend of mine. And I was like, hi, you're going to meet my girlfriend. And she was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? And I was like, yeah, you know, it's like no big deal. But and then it just kind of like happened. And no one was like, Oh, my God, I'm so shocked or surprised. But it just kind of was like, a this is me now. And thankfully, my parents were really fucking awesome. My family was amazing. Like, I think aside from the people that I probably worked with, and maybe previous partners, no one seemed to be surprised. So when you're with these men, but you know that you're gay, or you think you are gay, but you're being physical with them. Is there any, I understand that there's maybe emotionally it's tricky because in some of the cases you thought, you know, I actually do love this person as a person. Having sex with a man while you are gay and are you thinking about women in that moment or can you actually get aroused by a man just because of the physical nature of it? Um, I obviously can't speak for every lesbian, but I personally could not. Like, I felt like I had to really, like, sex was never, like, a fun thing for me. I wasn't like, oh, like, can't wait to have sex. Like, it was, like, like smelly and, like, I just, like, didn't like, 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 men and, like, the chest hair and, like, everything about it just, like, wasn't, like, because I was able to. For instance, my college boyfriend, I was able to connect with him because he was my best friend. So there was like an emotional part where I was like, okay, I don't feel like disgusted by you. Whereas later down the line, it was just like nothing was right. And it literally to a point, like aside from me being like, okay, I know that I want to explore this other part of me. There was a part like a moment where I was like, maybe I'm like just not into sex. Like maybe I'm just like not someone who enjoys having sex, you know? And like, and that I think was like internally me being like, bitch what like <laughs> what are you talking about like I don't know like maybe there's a world where that, that is the truth for other people but for me it was I could not 
get aroused. It was like very much, when is this going to be over? Take me into the first time when you let yourself have an experience and what's going through your mind and what is that experience like? Um, It is the most freeing experience of all time, I will say. I was very like on the low, just like creeping around on Tinder. You know, you're just like in my very early 20s and I was like, I'm just going to go on a date. I'm going to go on a date. Like all these other girls here are gay. Like what? This is like, it's like a fucking, there's a plethora of women that you could just like go out with and it's amazing and i remember the first time that i had sex with a woman i was like oh (laughs) i'm certainly not asexual like it just feels like like pew 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 like fireworks and like so natural and like the most natural experience that i could have possibly ever had whereas like it's like the puzzle fit whereas which is so funny because you think about like the puzzle like technically supporting to fit as it's supposed to but like with men it never felt that way to me it felt like such a chore such a like how was this going to be over oh my god I hated that that was the worst and like some shame afterwards and then with women it was like oh my god this this feels right like I feel like me I feel like whole and warm and wonderful and I was like okay (laughs) and yes (laughs) and everything I was ever debating before and go this is what we're doing now I'm so happy that you a found my people <laughs> found your people and that you had what sounds like a very positive coming out story in terms of sharing it with friends and family sounds like you had yeah. very supportive people around you which is amazing yeah it was awesome now let's chat motherhood because once you establish that you are gay and now you're starting to date women i'm curious mm-hmm. what your previous thoughts in your childhood or maybe early teens were about whether or not you wanted to be a mom or have a family and then how is this all shifting as you're coming out Mm -hmm. yeah I never really thought about having my own kids as it like it was never like I feel like a lot of people are are like oh I can't wait to like get married and have my family and you can like picture it as a kid like I never really thought of that and I don't really know why to be honest um I am the daughter of a military woman. We, she was a colonel in the army. We uh, traveled a bunch and there was always just like something going on in life, a big move, a big change. And I don't know if I like really had the time or like mental space to be like, and who do I want to marry? And where am I going to be in the kids and this and that? I remember like my wife and I joke now because on our first date together, we were walking, um, it was like on 23rd or something in New York. And she was like, do you want to have kids? And I was like, yeah, like it just kind of came out of my mouth. I don't think I'd really thought like too deeply about it. And then her follow up question was like, oh, would you carry? Because that's a very common question with like same sex women. Who's going to carry? Who's like, what's the deal? And I was like, yeah, I never thought about not carrying. And she was like, dope, we can continue. Like, it's like those things were like when you're dating seriously as a gay woman, like you really don't think about those things until you're confronted with those questions. And then you're like, oh yeah, am I gonna carry? And then what does that look like? And all of these things. But when we were ready to start the process of having kids, like at that time, and even then I think now, like there was just not enough resources or information to help us figure it the fuck out. It is so hard and confusing and difficult it's not like you know we just have sex and have kids there's like a process there's clinics there's tests there's genetic testing there's sperm banks you know there's once the kids are here adoption like there's so much to it where and this is like a huge reason why i wanted to come on this podcast and talk about it because i'm like if i had ever heard another woman who was trying to have kids with her partner I would have loved to hear what their experience was like because we were literally researching it was like Google was our best friend and we were just flying by the seat of our pants it was hard why do you think there was a difference between your partner not wanting to carry and knowing that so strongly that she would Mm -hmm. flat out say you know good I I don't want to carry you do we're a match how is it that some people want to and some don't that is like it's such a complicated question because it really goes back to your comfort level, how you feel about your body, how you express yourself. Um, for my wife, like, you know, like she'd joke about it and be like, I don't want to deal with the extra hormones. I simply cannot stand the thought of like having big boobs. Like, you know, there's some women who are uncomfortable with like large breasts or the bodily changes. And my wife is a pretty like androgynous presenting person. And I think the idea of her being super 
feminine and hormonal and like all it just like didn't feel right or authentic to who she was and so it is certainly different for everybody whereas for me I'm like yeah sure I'll get pregnant like you know I'll be pregnant I'll carry big boobs like I'm in you know like so many things that it just it is so so different and personal for everyone but in our particular case um she didn't think that it would feel right for her and then to take it a step further and obviously I don't like want to speak to her journey but um she did have some struggles with addiction early on and so you know part of like giving labor is like an epidural and going on really strong medication and then it's like oh my god like that that's a whole other kind of Mm -hmm. topic and concern so it was very clear from the get and it just happened that it both worked out that I was open and willing to carry and I was totally fine that she wasn't going to let's go to the logistics yes you decide as a couple we're married we want to have a child Mm -hmm. what is step one for us it was google (laughs) how do we have kids it was like okay we definitely need to go see a doctor so we're like nyu here we come we like walked into like the fertility thing and you know she had a little gay flag and we're like okay so you definitely know everything tell us everything and it was like the weirdest it felt very archaic she essentially told us that a insurance was never going to cover it and it did not Um, but b we had to prove in order to be even considered that we were having a year's worth of consexual heterosexual sex and we could not conceive a child. And she was telling us this. And Alicia and I are sitting there like, okay, so you need like dick pics? And like, how do we, what? And she was like, kind of, like I know the system's kind of fucked. Wait, you're telling me that a gay couple needs to have proof that they are having penetrative heterosexual sex consensually basically like a couple you know basically one of them having sex with another with a man while Mm. the partner is either there or knows that it's happening to try to impregnate you before you can even i don't even know if like the partner's involved yeah it was just like if you want insurance to cover it you have to basically prove that you're infertile therefore and we're like how do you even track that it just felt so we were so discouraged when we left that office and it wasn't that it was like we just looked at each other and we were like, oh, this is going to be way harder than we thought. And that was the beginning of everything that came afterwards, finding clinics, finding clinics that were um, going to be helpful with like same sex. Because obviously there's fertility clinics, but there's also fertility clinics who are really well versed in what it's like to deal with same sex individuals and people who are trying family as an, trying to have a family as an LGBTQIA person. So after that, we, we found our clinic. Um, there was a lot of in between trying to figure it out. But um, we found the clinic that we liked that resonated with us. And then it's like, okay, now we have to find sperm. Like, and I don't quite remember the order of this all happening. I do remember like we got really hammered during COVID and we like looked at each other and we we're like, you trying to buy some sperm tonight? Like, <laughs> We're just like, and it was like really fucking fun. You go on the cryobanks and you're like, okay, you can like choose who you're trying to like. And that was like a fun game for us. And we would do it here and there. And I I remember that. What info do they give you about the people? So you can see height, you can see genetic history, you can, depending on the level that you subscribe to, because everything's a business, um, you can hear their voice, you can you see and read essays that they've written, personality tests, um, medical history, If you had to describe what you were looking for in this sperm bank, how Mm -hmm. would you describe it? I mean, obviously, everyone kind of wants general positive personality traits. But what were you guys? Totally. What what stood out to you? We, well, physically, we wanted someone who had a diverse background. I am Puerto Rican, Afro-Latina. My wife is white, but she was raised, um, her dad who raised her is Mexican and like, Spanish heritage is huge for us. So we wanted diversity and background. I, I personally didn't want an exclusively like white donor because, um, my heritage is really important to me. So finding like the heritage and the physical piece was one. And then when you get into like the emotional, psychological stuff, like, um, I remember we were listening to the, our donor's conversation. He made like a offhanded remark about death. And he made like his interviewer almost uncomfortable. He like made a joke about it. And we were like, oh, him. Like, first of all, Alicia and I talk about death regularly. I'm not really sure what that says about us. But it was like very much like something that I think both of us were like, oh, he's someone who if we were at a bar with him or in a room with him, like we could have banter. He talked about his family. 
Um, his background was music. My wife is a musician. My family is full of musicians. So there was a lot of like synchronicity there. And then knowing his background and, um, you know, his ethnicity, we were like, oh, this is our guy. And how do we buy out all of your sperm? We took out our Amex and we were like, purchase all. Good night. Thank you. Come here. And that was it. We loved him. And is that who ended up being the father of both of your children now? The donor, yeah. The donor, not the father. Yes. Every We get that all the time. It's like, oh, who's the dad or who's the father? And it's always like, it's the donor. Right. Like, you know, because to be a father is to be a father, to be a it dad, It is an interesting question about the language of dad, father versus donor, especially yeah. when there is no dad or father in the picture. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the donor, like, I shout out to donors in general, like, they're really helping families have families and it's really special and Alicia and I you know sometimes we talk about this late at night like wouldn't it be cool to meet him one day and just to like thank him for helping us you know like would we want to meet him like what does he look like you know it's like it is a crazy unknown that we will only know if our children decide that that's something they want to explore we're not going to close that door for them um but yeah it's interesting it, it's always a donor but everyone's like oh so is that the father it literally what you said and it's like it's, it's no big deal because obviously that's how people express it but it's like it's the donor he's helped us complete our family let's talk about the credit card going down <laughs> how much money went down on this credit card to buy out this man's sperm um yeah so let me preface by saying it was actually my mother-in-law's credit card <laughs> <laughs> we called her. We were in LA and we're like, hi, mom. Uh, we're trying to buy some sperm. She was like, whatever you guys want to do. So shout out to Pam. She's fucking G. Um, we did not. It was it was $12,000. How much sperm was that? We bought all of his vials. So it's basically um, about a grand per vial, depending on the type of sperm that you're buying. You could buy it washed. You can buy it not washed. It's washed? Like What's a the process. difference? Like it's already gone through the process of like people went in and like picked out the sperms i think <laughs> I, I i used to know this had you asked me five years ago but um there's certain types of sperm that you use depending on the type of insemination it's also more expensive to have the washed pre-washed sperm um i think they just go through and like just pick out like the good ones you know it's just like were you creme de la cremes understood understood <laughs> i mean some are misshapen some yeah can't make Some are it, going so. in a different direction. Yeah, absolutely. They just, and you need certain a certain number of vials per cycle of trying. So we're like, well, we don't know. And we don't want him to run out. So we're just going to buy them all. In regards to you buying all the vials, was that only purely because you wanted to have as many shots at getting pregnant slash you maybe wanted future kids? Or yes. was there any part of it that was like, we don't want someone else to use this man's sperm? Um, if I'm being honest, it was a little bit of both. The biggest one was we don't know how this is going to work. We don't know how many times we're going to need to try this. I would rather have too much than too little. We knew we wanted our children to be genetically related. So we need to buy it all because we don't know what the fuck's about to happen. We're going to buy it all. And then the second is like, selfishly, I'm like, damn, like, they're going to have a lot of diblings, like donor siblings. And if I can maybe limit that just so that it's not like a fucking free for all. And I was like naive at the time, too, because they do limit the amount of times that a donor can donate. They're not just going to like let him donate lifetime supply, you know. So little things like that I didn't know at the time. But I think there was a fear also just being like a first time parent slash sperm buyer slash all of it where I wanted to protect my future children. And like, if, if it could be traumatic, I don't know, like we're still in this, but like, who knows what life's going to be like in 18 years when our kids are like asking questions. I mean, they're gonna ask questions sooner. My two year old is like fucking, she acts like she's 13. She can barely speak, but it's like, yeah, there was a little bit of like, uh, maybe I just want you to myself. But I mean, since then, you know, he's re-upped. People have purchased in. So our, our kids will have their donor siblings. And that's just a matter of what it is. Was that $12,000 purchase the first expense in this whole process? Or was there a yes. lot of other stuff? That was the first expense. You now have the sperm. And how yes. do you and your partner make the decision of whose egg you're using? Um, well, we both knew that we each wanted to have a bio, a bio kit of our own. I wanted to have a bio kit. Alicia really wanted to have one. So the question really became like, who goes first? And so that's when you go into a lot of testing. You have to do 
look at how many eggs you have. You have to do like a lot of uterus inspections. Like there's a lot that goes on to that. And we assumed because Alicia's um, like two or three years older than me that she would have to go first. And it ended up being that like I had a way lower egg count. Mm. And so our doctor was like, actually, JK, you're going first. So um, we always knew that I was going to be the one that would go first. And then, and that was like the, that process. It, it's like so hard. I feel like I'm like stumbling over my words because there's so much that's part of it. But Alicia, we would have to do an egg retrieval. And for me, which is our IVF, IVF, reverse IVF. And then for me, it was just IUI, which is a simple shot of sperm into your uterus. So you are chosen to go first. I'm the chosen one first. And yes. <laughs> emotionally was that once that decision was made was that something that both of you were just 100 percent on board with at first yeah oh yeah yeah we were like let's go like we always knew our kids were going to be here it didn't matter how it was just like what's the doctor recommending and how do we make it happen so when they were like alana you're up i was like all right what do i need to do and that's when i began my journey um and once i was pregnant alicia began hers and then two years later we completed that Milo was recently struggling with very early morning wake-ups, and a follower suggested that we put a hatch restore in his room and use the sunrise light. So now he knows not to call us in until this light turns on, which we've programmed for 7 a.m. We tell him the light means the sun is up, and if the light's not on, it's not time to get up. After months of us loving our hatch in his room, we took the plunge and decided to get one for our bedroom too, because it's honestly amazing for anyone who wants to prioritize their rest. So in case you've never seen this device before, the Hatch Restore teaches your body when it's time to sleep or wake up with nighttime and morning routines. There's exclusive content loaded onto it like Pillow Talk, which is an audio series that helps you wind down. Basically, the types of TV shows you love, true crime, sports, whatever you're into, but without the screens, that would actually hurt your rest. And my favorite part is the sunrise alarm, which you can program on a timer and then wake up slowly to a beautiful sunrise. And right now, Hatch is offering my listeners $20 off their purchase of a Hatch Restore and free shipping at hatch.co slash real stuff. Visit hatch.co slash real stuff to get $20 off plus free shipping. That's hatch.co slash real stuff. I'm always curious with IUI. Is it literally just a syringe of sperm that's just shot in just like a penis? Yep. It's super romantic. It's you and your partner and the doctor. Your feet are up in the straps. And yeah, they have like the syringe with like a long thing and they just go in and you fingers crossed and hope it sticks. And you only do it once in a cycle? Um, yes, you only have one shot in your cycle. And if it doesn't stick, then you kind of have to start the process again. Um, you take like a shot, you stab yourself in the belly, you try to like increase your chances and then do the shot. If it doesn't work, you try again. But um, we were fortunate that Wild stuck on the first try. She did. She did, that little girl. Not surprised. She's, she's stubborn. She, she was trying to burrow her way in there. <laughs> she's been, yeah. She's like, yeah, we were now knowing her now. I'm like, yeah, you would. Was what was the additional cost at this time of doing the IUI? Twelve hundred dollars for IUI. Okay. Which, when you look at everything else, you're like, that's the cheapest option. So a mm -hmm. lot of people start with IUI because you don't want to have to. If if IUI didn't work for me, and say I had to do it multiple times and it didn't work, then I would have had to go through the process of removing my eggs, creating the embryos, and then reimplanting, um, which is a huge expense, also. So now Wild comes and She's I here. mean she is your twin. Yes. I don't know what this this donor looked like, but she Literally. is you. Yeah. We say that we're like and what did the donor do? We're like maybe the eczema. Like <laughs> maybe the asthma, unsure, but like yeah, she is my she's my tiny twin. What was the experience of having a baby and entering those early days of postpartum and new parenthood? with a yeah. partner who wasn't biologically involved in that? Um, it was really hard. So because there's only so much your partner can do, you know, like you have to have a partner who and thankfully Alicia was like emotionally there for me, my rock, because Wild's birth was my postpartum was pretty traumatic because I had some really severe stitch. I had like 72 stitches and I lost a lot of blood. Wow. Was it um, a... a c-section it was no it was vaginal 72 but, vaginal stitches 
yeah on the ins- she came out with like an arm out and she just fucking sliced right through Ooh. so yeah and i didn't i didn't even realize what was happening because you know you know in the moment of giving birth like everything's and then all of a sudden they're like still stitching but what happened was our she came at a time where our doctors were changing shifts so my doctor left and i had to basically wait for the next doctor and they were like can you hold her in and i was like can i what now like no and he comes in flying with his lab coat or whatever his fucking scrubs and he's like you ready to have a baby i'm like she's literally out like she's halfway out let's go so it was very fast like trying to get in the moment and be there and hold her arms like that just didn't happen so she just kind of flew out so postpartum was really difficult for me because i physically was going through some pretty tremendous recovery plus breastfeeding was really difficult for me in the beginning plus postpartum hormones in general and your life just completely changing so i remember alicia like looking at me at one point and she's like i don't know what else i could like how can i be here like i can't feel what you're feeling i can't breastfeed for you like i always said when wild cried i cried because i knew that she was gonna have to latch and that was like traumatic for me at the time and so it was very much like I just needed Alicia to be like, I'm proud of you. You're doing a great job. I love you. What do you need? And she was able to to do all those things for me. But we did have conversations where she's like, I don't even know what you're going through. Like, I'm exhausted and I didn't have the child. Like, I feel like shit and I don't have postpartum hormones raging. So, I mean, it's very much like just making sure you have a partner who can emotionally be there for you when you feel like physically you're fucking done. In some ways, it's very similar to a heterosexual relationship where the partner is helpless and cannot breastfeed for you or can't take on any of the role that you have to do. Yeah. But I'm trying, I guess I'm trying to gauge if there is any difference or any emotional difference given the fact that the partner you're with biologically wasn't involved or maybe there's absolutely no difference and it's just like that's your partner and that's the baby's mom yeah i mean i think i mean i think that's what it is like it's that's your partner that's your other like the other mom and like you start to establish what are our roles going to look like as caregivers together because sure i fell into the traditional like breastfeeding and all these things but like really trying to bring alicia in so that she could feel connected and part of like equally as a nurturer which i can imagine was probably confusing and difficult because your like maternal instincts kick in but you're not producing the milk and you're not the one that the baby has like been smelling so i don't i don't i can't imagine what that would have felt like for her but i think and from our conversations she was more concerned about like me than her needing to like physically have the baby on her what were some of those things that you did to try to make sure she felt involved? Um, a lot of skin to skin. It was a lot of like, okay, I can change a diaper, sure, but like that's literally the one thing that you can do while all this is happening. So she would wake up with me, she would change the diaper, I would grab, I would breastfeed. It was like we had like our system in the middle of the night that was working for us. So like, obviously there was more than just changing diapers, but like eventually helping with feeding when we moved to bottles, like a huge reason why we moved to bottles faster with Rio is because I think with wild, we were still learning, but she always said like, I want to be part of that feeding process to like help you. And I was always worried, like if we switch to bottles too quickly, like, will that help? Will that affect the speech? Or, you know, like all the shit you hear as a first time mom, like so stupid. Um, So I remember when we were getting ready to have Rio, she was like, let's switch to bottles sooner. And I was like, 100%. That way she could be part of those feedings. Because I think in the very beginning, like feeding is really like, all they do is like shit, eat and sleep. Like, so what part (laughs) of that can you be a part of without you're not smelling poop? It's like, it's the feeding part. So that was probably the biggest in my heterosexual relationship, there were plenty of times that in my postpartum period, I felt some resentment towards my husband of, I want you to be able to help me and do this stuff, but your body is literally useless. And <laughs> although you are hands-on helping yeah. me and, and taking on a lot of this load, what, you know, so much so much inner rage about why biologically women have to be the ones to do this 
and how yeah. it's like not fair from a universe yeah. perspective. And yeah. I'm curious how that potential resentment gets amplified when you're with a partner who actually mm-hmm. could have done it biologically, mm-hmm. but didn't want to. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Like, we had this conversation. Like, I told her that I wanted to carry. She was very clear that that was not something that she wanted to do. So it's hard to then have resentment for someone afterwards. Like, but we had this discussion. And it's not to say that, like, she wouldn't. She always said, if for some reason you couldn't get pregnant, I'm in. Like, I'm there for you. I'm carrying. You know, like, bless her. I know she would have hated it, but she would have done it if I couldn't carry. So the resentment wasn't like fuck you, you could have done this, like, and now I have to deal with it because we always knew that that was going to be me. I think resentment ended up coming later when it was very much like, oh, because the babies like relied on me so much in the beginning, there's more of a clinginess at times. And can you just, can you just, so I can have a moment of peace, like take them, you know what I mean? So we ended up having like a huge conversation about that when Wild was eight months old and we went to therapy for a little bit. And I was like, I feel as if resentment is building up because I feel like I'm doing a lot and I need more of you. And she was like, okay, cool. Thank you for saying something because I would have never known because you just do things. And sometimes I don't know like what, how I can jump in and help you. So we actually went to therapy for a little bit. Um, Again, bless her. I knew she fucking hated it, but it was really helpful because it, at least gave me the reminder to ask for help because I'm the type of person who just kind of does. And I don't even realize I need help. And then all of a sudden I'm like crying in the bathroom and I'm like, Oh, I need some help. You know? So that, that was more the resentment versus the, you have a body that could have done this and you didn't. Mm. I mean, it's so great how communicative you guys were and how you have to be, I guess, theoretically opposite. You guys felt about the desire to carry. I can imagine a gay couple having issues if maybe both say they don't want to carry and then one has to concede or maybe they yeah. both want to carry and then it's like how do you decide yeah the or first one and one, one. Mm-hmm. yeah exactly yeah. how do you decide the first one yeah there's so many different scenarios so many and it's like i feel for everyone because it's such a you really have to make sure that you are communicating with your partner because it can turn I mean, you know, it's like with any partner, if you don't communicate with that person, especially during a time where you're having kids, it's like it could be a game changer. So for your second experience and your second pregnancy, you had to do IVF. So yes, what is the cost of, you know, I'm I'm making a tally of your cost so far. We're at, I think it's (laughs) $13,200. About. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, All right. So what what happens with IVF? How much does that cost? And how easy was that for your body? Um, so it was harder for, it was a, it was a two for, it was a two part. Alicia took her eggs out when I was still pregnant with wild. So that whole process was a lot of medications for her, a lot of uncomfortable hormones for her, the retrieval, all of that was a moment where it's like, I'm pregnant and hormonal. She's going through a process. We're both trying to be there for each other. Um, the whole process I believe was about $30,000. Maybe more. I would have to go back, but I, 30,000 is like sticking my head for some reason. So this is the big expense of this is the big expense. Yes. Because you're taking out the eggs, you're fertilizing them, you're doing genetic testing on them to see which ones you're going to implant. And then you're doing all the medication for the other partner. So I had to like jab myself every day for months. And how old is wild Um, at this point? She, when I was doing the medications, she was about, she was a year old. Okay. I started, she turned one in October and we, I started medication November and we implanted in January. Okay. Or December. But yeah, so all, oh my God, it was like, it was insane. So I would say about 30 grand for everything. And so we just had those embryos on ice chilling until we were ready. And we were like, we just want to knock these bad boys out. And once I knew what it was like being pregnant and that whole journey, I was like, let's fucking go. Let's get this over with. Finish this up. (laughs) Let's finish it up. Yeah, I'm not doing it again. I'm good. Did that IVF work the first cycle? Yes. You are a fertile myrtle. I literally, I was like, great. I mean, good to fucking know. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. I'm, I'm very thankful and I have a lot of gratitude. I know it is incredibly fucking hard and I don't take that for granted. So I am very thankful that that happened first try on both tries because I, I don't know, like mentally, I think it would have been really fucking hard. For the second child, did you guys choose the sex? 
Yes, we did. That's where, that's like one of the perks of being a same sex couple. It's everyone's like, oh, I don't want to like, just let it. I'm like, no, I want to fucking pick. Okay. If I can have one perk, I would like to pick. And it's not like we're like, oh, you'll have this color eyes. Like, I think that exists, but obviously we didn't do that. It was just like, do you want to do the boy or the girl or whatever? And we were like, well, who's the, who has the strongest chance of making it? And our doctor was like, this is the strongest and it's the male and whatever a fucking jargon they have. And we're like, okay, him, put him in. Let's go. And you just put one embryo in? Just one. Yeah. Is that normal or is it typical to put in more than one? I think it depends on the clinic. I have heard where people have had multiple and maybe that's to increase chances, but we, our doctor was very strict on like it's one and we try and then adjust and we only had three. So. Oh, you only had three embryos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was we'll that to the end. all, does, does that mean that when your wife did the egg harvesting, she got three healthy eggs? By the end of it. Yeah. I think that she had like eight to begin with and that's pretty i've heard people that are like i had 24 eggs and i'm like wow i thought eight was a lot but she had eight and then three made it to the end who were viable enough for implantation rio's born what is your Mm -hmm. pregnancy and postpartum slash delivery like with rio um totally different my pregnancy i was like used to it i had a lot of hormones in the beginning because once you're pregnant you have to continue your ivf hormones throughout your first trimester oh interesting and it it was yeah brutal like brutal i was like holy shit am i gonna make it um so the why do you have to do that just to make the body increase your chances of keeping it yeah it's Mm -hmm. like a foreign body i guess and you just don't want to be getting rid of it so that he was like a more difficult pregnancy we had a lot of um scares during it Uh, i had to get an amnio have you heard of what an amnio is where they just stab the needle in you yeah we had a little um scare there and i had to go do that whole process which was like was that for for further genetic testing yeah they they there was like a a flag of an abnormality and our doctor called us and I remember that I was like sobbing because we were both like, oh my God, what? Like we pay all this money to do genetic testing and I'm like oh, literally 20 weeks pregnant and you're telling me something could be wrong. And so, you know, having that whole conversation of like, what happens? What happens if this is like a serious condition? Like, do we continue? Do we not? Like, and that was a whole other thing. And really we we dealt with that very privately. Um, but it was, it was uh, uh, thankfully everything was okay, but it was a harder pregnancy and then giving birth, I was in labor for longer than I was with Wild, and he actually came out with his um, umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. So mm-hmm. he he literally wasn't breathing. And I like I'm obsessed with my doctor. She like worked so quickly. I had no idea what was happening. It wasn't until I looked at Alicia's face and I was like, "Fuck, something's wrong." And it wasn't until she like slapped him on me and it, like it was like <gasps> like. It, it, I didn't realize that something was wrong until after the fact, you know, you're just like going to mom yeah. mode and it was like, Alicia was like, she literally put him on you and you like gave him life. It was wow. the craziest thing. Um, I just got the chills thinking about it because I was like really fucking crazy. But yeah. um, so that was like also traumatic in its own. I was pushing and pushing. I popped all the blood vessels in my face. I was like, why isn't he coming out? Like, what is going on here? And that's why obviously you're like being fucking oh. basically like strangling on the way out. So that was hard. But postpartum was much easier i didn't have all those ribs i healed i healed perfectly after wild even though it took months and over six months to be cleared with wild with him super minor barely a tear and that was great i was like well good (laughs) good because i don't know if i could have done that again um so they kind of like switched switched and they're also very opposite personalities so it was it was a whole thing This episode of The Real Stuff is sponsored by BetterHelp, and I don't think I could have chosen a more fitting platform to partner with for this show. A couple years back, when I first started to feel called to try therapy, the whole process of finding the right therapist just felt so daunting to me. So I decided to go down the simplest route possible and try BetterHelp. First of all, it's entirely online, which is beyond convenient for a busy schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire, you get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. For me, therapy is so important because if I don't have that outlet once a week or once every other week, I wind up putting all of those thoughts on Michael, and then I find it really diminishes the amount of enjoyable quality time that we can spend together in our already hectic lives. So if you've been thinking of trying therapy, you can visit betterhelp.com slash Lucy Fink to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Lucy Fink. And remember, Lucy is spelled L-U-C-I-E. 
I'm going to ask this question in regards to both of you separately, and maybe you can speak more to your experience. But Mm -hmm. was there any emotional difference for you of carrying a child that was your egg versus carrying another woman's egg? Zero. 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 They are both, as far as I'm concerned, genetically mine. <laughs> like, there, it's just not like, it is such an experience. And I'm, I'm really curious to hear about a surrogate's journey. And because I just was like so connected. I literally, I'm technically a surrogate. Like, it's not my yeah, DNA. Yeah, that second like pregnancy donor is sperm. similar. Yeah, my partner's egg. And I was like, I was so connected. Like, that is my baby. You know what I mean? I don't care if he's blonde with blue eyes. That boy is mine. You know what I mean? Genetically, in my mind, there's like no difference. And Alicia says the same thing about Wild. And it's crazy because Wild's personality is Alicia's Hmm. and Rio's personality is mine. So it's like, we forget, you know, you don't like talk. It's like, these are our kids, but it's funny because I'm like, oh my God, like that. I wonder if Wild has that because you had that when you were a kid. And then we're like, oh no, she couldn't. She literally couldn't, you know? So it's like, you don't really think about it too much. We've talked here and there about like, oh, that's crazy. But no, that's that's my baby. And so I guess similarly from Alicia's standpoint, did she report any sort of biological bodily differences of having a child that was her egg versus having wild? No, I think for her, she, we just talked about this the other day. We were having like one of our philosophical conversations and she was like, what if one day like Wilde's mad at me and she says, well, you're not my real mom. And she was like, I will fucking die. I will be heartbroken. And I was like, Alicia, she's never going to say that. Like you're her mom. That's we are all she knows. Like, and vice versa with Rio, Rio, like our kids, we are all they know. And so there's never going to be a world where she's like, you're not my real mom. Like it's just, but there's, there's that fear. And I think for Alicia, it's like, that fear of like rejection and potentially because wild isn't genetically hers like will there be a disconnect in the future like i think she has that insecurity speaking of that how have you guys talked about the conversations that you plan on having with your children and how you plan on introducing them to the reality of how they came to the world yeah i mean we are gonna let them lead in terms of when they start to ask questions, we will be there to help them answer. And I mean, this comes down to like a science, you know, like we don't really know what we're going to say yet, but we know the process. We know that we, they will always know regardless that their moms desperately wanted them. Like you are not a mistake. We worked really fucking hard to have you. And we're so happy that you're here and we're literally obsessed with you. Like just cause you look like her and you look like me doesn't mean that I'm not less of your mom and vice versa. Cause to be a mother, to be a parent is so much more than having the blood DNA. It's about like raising them and the trust and the foundation that you build and like memories and experience like being a parent is so much more than just being genetically related you could be a shitty fucking parent or you could be a great fucking parent and have no you know no genetic tie to the person that you're parenting so um we will cross that bridge when we get there but we are very much like are they gonna ask early when they do like what do we say are they gonna want to like explore the donor like now with ancestry dna is donor really and is there like any anonymity behind being a donor who knows like we're all exploring this for the first time like we're in a new wave of this and so we will all learn as a family together but bottom line is our kids will always know that they're loved and they weren't mistakes and that we will we will go to the any we will literally do anything for them and i love the way how you said that wild has Alicia's personality and Rio has your personality. I love the way it's so interwoven and it it almost, I don't know, it just almost brings the four of you guys together in such a beautiful way. Yeah, and it is a testament to like, we are a family raising each other. Like Like Wild is raising me and Alicia as much as we're raising her. You know what I mean? Like you connect in a way that is so deep. Like as any parent knows, you understand it. It's like, And then all of a sudden you see like your child taking on traits of your spouse and it's like maybe physically they don't look alike, but who the fuck cares? Because they're both saying the same shit. They're both moving their mouth in the same way, their mannerisms. It's like that's that's like nature, you know, or nurture versus nature. It's just it's cool. It's been really cool to see, but it's definitely made us closer. So after you have 
at least your first child. And, you know, I'm thinking back to my experience of being postpartum, being out in the world and sort of appearing in the world as a new mom and just receiving how the world reacted to me and responded to me and some of the things that were said to me sort of just Mm -hmm. insinuating that I must be in a heterosexual relationship, you know, Mm -hmm. how's your husband doing or um, I don't know, just asking general questions about my my pregnancy, assuming that I even carried my baby in the first place. And Mm -hmm. it sounds like with you and Alicia, you had these incredibly supportive friends and family around you. So it probably felt very normal and typical at home. What was your experience going out into the world and what types of (laughs) commentary did you experience? (laughs) <laughs> that is when you really start to like you notice like stairs as a gay couple when you're like holding hands or something but you really notice stairs when you have two babies or one and it's like the looking and looking and looking down and like you know the meme of the like woman with the math and it's like the calculations like no one fucking knows but <laughs> we get a kick out of it because like it's so easy to be offended by that but like can you blame people no like it's an interesting family dynamic like it is what it is it's one thing to be an asshole about it but it's another thing just to be curious and like alicia does a lot of drop-offs she does most of the drop-offs and pickups at school i don't want to say a lot she does them all that's like her thing she does drop off and pick up we were at like a parents event and i was there holding rio and one of the moms that alicia sees at pickup or drop-off was talking to her blah, blah blah insert i'm here we're chatting and she goes oh and um which one is yours and I was like, oh, the same one. Like we shared we, that that one's mine too. And then she was like, oh, um, and she, like the uncomfortable. She, oh, does she? Oh, I just, you know. And it was like all of a sudden she was like, <laughs> I just want to have the world eat me up. And Alicia's like, yeah, we're lesbians. Like you know, she like gets a kick out of making people uncomfortable like that. But it is very much like a lot of education, a lot of yes. Like when people see me with Rio. It's like, oh, he's like blonde with blue eyes and you're very not that. So it's very much like, oh, are you okay, mom? You know, it's like, it's very much like sometimes Alicia is just like my friend. Like, I, th- I remember one time we went to a doctor's appointment. They're like, okay, mom, you can sit right here just like looking at me. And Alicia's like, I guess I'll just go die then. They're like, oh, and are you going <laughs> to wait like outside? And she's like, I'm also the mom. So it's like, it's really refreshing when you're in a situation where they're like, all right, mom's like, come on in. I remember that happened to us recently where they're, oh, we were at an Aritzia in the mall, like random. And we were at checkout and the woman behind was like, hi, moms. Like, you know, like, just and we I felt so seen and welcome and they gave wild stickers and it was so cool and I was like oh my god that was so dope she said moms like did you hear that because it's always like a uh uh, and which one and this is awkward and it's funny I could see a decent number of people kind of seeing you guys even if you are with one or two kids and maybe just thinking maybe they're close friends or sisters sisters or yeah who the hell knows Um, yeah so it must be really refreshing when someone is like, yeah. I assume you are the parents. Yes. Hi, moms. We were like, hello. Hi. And I'll literally buy this entire store now simply because you acknowledge <laughs> our existence. Like, as yes, a Aritzia. Unit. Good job. Yes, Aritzia. Go off. <laughs> For heterosexual people that are navigating through the world and who mm. are having babies, man and woman, and are now existing with their babies, how can heterosexual people show up towards gay couples and gay parents in a way that would be the best received is there something that you don't want people to say to you are there things that are very meaningful when it's said to you Mm -hmm. um that's a really good question i think like the biggest thing is just like not making a big deal out of it you know like oh you're the mom's dope like when we go to parent events like no one it is very normal that we are just both the moms. Like no one makes us, I'm never like, oh, that's weird. Like that dad like was weird and awkward. Like it, it is almost better to like, first of all, I welcome any and all questions. If you're like, oh, this is so, you know, but would love to know, like, of course I'm all about education, but there's nothing more refreshing than just feeling like everybody else. Like we're all here tired, dropping off our stupid <laughs> gremlins <laughs> or tyrants and like that's it. And we'll do play dates and you know, it's, it's never been. Just just feeling like we're everyone else. What area do you guys live in? Jersey City. And you super the diverse. School is like you find that it's diverse and forward thinking. Very much so. Very, very much so. And there's another 
Um, I've seen two moms also. I have not said hello to them yet, but you know, you do like the little gay nod, like I see you, you too, me too. Um, but it's super diverse and you know, we're discussing maybe like you guys like moving out to the suburbs. And my biggest thing is like, I don't want to be the only brown girl and I don't want us to be the only gays in the village. Like we may be comfortable with who we are, but like, what is that going to, how are our children going to feel growing up? And like, what if they are the only kids in class with two gay parents like it's a whole thing for them too and I don't want to like be in a place that's not welcoming that I'm curious if there's any other aspect of your story or your life now that you feel like is worthy of diving into on the show I feel like you've really kind of like dug deep you've done you've gotten in there you've asked all of the questions so I I feel good about that um but I don't know I I think like it's been really awesome to see your and hear how other parents with children have been talking about sex life and being a good parent and a good partner and all of that because it does affect gay people exactly the same way. So just shout out to you for like sharing all that. I think it's dope. But as far as like, I don't know, being a gay parent, like we're just like everybody else. It's really fucking hard, but we're also gay and it's a whole process to get there. And then all of a sudden you're a parent and you're figuring out what it's like to be a parent. So, you know. I, I think you really you really got in there, Lucy. You really asked. You really I'm asked glad. I, I I didn't prepare questions for this. I just I, love that. I felt like we were just as friends, you know, diving yeah. into your whole story. And I was maybe yeah. asking some more thought provoking questions than someone might ask over a cup of coffee. But 100%. you were really open, and it sounds like your relationship is so strong. I'm. I feel like you guys have done everything. In the perfect way. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but by the end of this process, obviously the cost of having children aside and raising children, the actual cost of getting to the point of having kids or having two kids was, you know, over $40,000. And that's a big investment. If someone is in a gay relationship and wants to have children and can't afford that out of pocket, what do you Mm -hmm. recommend? I would say start saving. We waited three years. We were saving for three years and it was like everything that we ever had went into saving, went into saving, went into saving. And it was like a lot of sacrificing experiences and other things simply because we knew that our end goal was kids. Um, and we knew that it was going to cost us a lot of money. Um, being really smart about your savings, really looking into like different credit cards and options. There's like really awesome credit cards out there that give you points <laughs> that, can, you know, you can like really work with. And I think it's just like being really financially smart, you know, because we didn't start the process having the, the lifestyle that we do now. We started really small and we were like, fuck, are we going to be able to afford like an almost $50,000 bill? And this is over the course of time, you know, so have your savings and when you want something hard enough you make it fucking happen and and it's it's a lot it's really hard i realize i actually do have two more questions yes well first do your children call you both mom or is there a discrepancy mom mommy mama who's who's who i'm mama and alicia's mommy hi mama that's cute initially alicia wanted to be mama but wild started calling me mama because the way it was very odd and very like primal almost like she when she wanted food she associated me with food and her sound was ma 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 like that's just the sound she made so i was like okay well here i am with the food and f- weirdly and so annoying and the be- annoying for alicia but when she wanted to play it was da 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 mm. and it was a lot of da so all of a sudden, Alicia was like, I don't want to be fucking Dada. And she was like, then people are going to look at me and they're going to be like, oh, you lesbian. Like, of course you want to be Dada. Like, you know, like she was like, I don't, I want to be mom too. But then it had to be a very, and I will give myself the kudos for this because if it were for Alicia, she would have some weird fucking name because she just like, she was like, I don't know. She can call me whatever she wants. And I was like, no, because this is going to be a thing. Like we c- it can't be da. Just, you want to be da? She was like, no. And I was like, okay, I'm, I've been already, I'm mama. It's going to happen in Spanish. It's mama. It works, whatever. So I was like, you're going to be mommy. And so we would do like, okay, here's the phone. Pass it to mommy, mom, mommy. And then all of us, you know, you train, train, train. You have to like really train. So then all of a sudden one day, Wild was like, oh, hey, mommy. And Alicia was like, oh my God. Oh, <laughs> yes. So yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot of work. You, you have to like really train them. Otherwise they're calling you whatever the fuck, you, you know? Yes. Two moms, like what? 
And you did. I mean, but what's interesting is from the standpoint of a baby, they don't know. I don't think children know. There's nothing in them biologically that says, I need to have a man and a woman. They don't fucking yeah, care or they know. They have no idea. They have no so idea. So if there's two moms there, then it's like, okay, what are your names? I need to know what to call you. Exactly. On TikTok, I'll see moms that have been like, we never figured it out. So some names I'm mom and that's other mommy or mom like, you know, and it, it's everyone's like trying to figure it out together. But I knew very certainly that I wanted each of us to have a name because it's important. Like your kid wants to know who they're, you know, mm-hmm. who are you? What's your what, name? Or even just how can I get your attention? How can I get your attention? Yeah. Most recently, I'm Mama Dixon <laughs> and Alicia's Mommy Dixon. She's like really experimenting with the last name. And I was like, yeah, you're kind of right. You're not How wrong. did that how you chose to take your partner's last name. Yes. So I was very, for the longest time, like I had built my career on Alana Rodriguez. I'm Alana Maria Rodriguez Aleman from Puerto Rico. Like that was my shit. I was like, I'm never taking someone else's last name. And I remember Alicia was like, I'll be a Rodriguez. But it was like, it hit me different. And maybe it was like the man and woman thing where it's like, I felt more open to taking her last name. Whereas I think like, thinking of it how I had thought about it as the past it was like I don't want to take a man's last name like very much that and also a sense of ownership over myself but with Alicia I was like I've first of all never really heard your last name Rodriguez is like the smith of fucking Puerto Rico it's like I I can look down the street and throw a rock at someone and their last name will be Rodriguez so I was like I want something different I want something that really feels like ours um so that was a name that Alicia, so her biological father's last name is Dixon and he has no other, it felt like very fresh for us. He didn't raise her, um, but that was like a name that was very true to her and very unique. And it was like, she owned that little space. And I was like, I'm down, let's go in there and I'll do that. And she was like, we can hyphenate your last name. But growing up with like a thousand names as a Spanish person, I was like, I'm not doing a Dixon Rodriguez. Like it's simply, I know what that's like and it's annoying. In hindsight, I think my family was really like, but your heritage and your culture and like, you're proud to be Latina. Like there's so much. And I was like, I've had to really a come to terms with that. Cause there's some days where I'm like, should I have hyphenated their last name? But there's others that it's like, I teach my kids who they are and about our culture through the language we speak at home where by um, bilingual home through the books that they read through the knowledge that we give them about their culture like there's so much more than just a name but um yeah there was a, a huge dialogue and we were both open to taking each other's but at the end of the day I was like let's just do dicks and start fresh it sounds like in a lot of ways in your relationship although you are both women that Alicia has and especially now with the name mm-hmm. that in terms of stereotypical roles she has stepped more into a masculine role yes I would say so. Yeah, but it's funny because we joke at home that I'm more masculine than she is, like in terms (laughs) of like our our like um, vibe sometimes. Mm. But yeah, yeah, I would say so. We're both we're both very dominant people. But um, yeah, I mean, I took her last name and she didn't carry the kids. So I guess traditionally, yeah. I I was thinking of it when we talked about it a little bit, but Mm -hmm. I'm just curious in your early postpartum period or even just in everyday life now with young kids. Mm -hmm. What is your division of labor like in your relationship? So it's she cooks, I clean. She does pick up and drop off. I get Rio ready in the morning. She gets wild ready in the morning. It's easier with two kids. In the beginning when it was just wild, I did feel like I was doing a bulk of everything. And once we had that discussion that I talked to you about, it was like, how are the, what are the areas that she can help me with? Um, So I do the laundry. I do a lot, but she does enough where it is really helpful for me. And also like there's something about cleaning that's like enjoyable for me. So she got fucking lucky with that (laughs) because cleaning and like being in my own space like just like eases anxiety. So whatever, she can have that. But yeah, our division is not 50-50. I don't think it ever is. But she does a lot to help me where I don't feel like I'm gonna die. And you guys both work. We both work. Yeah, which is a whole other thing. A whole other thing. A conversation for another day. Maybe we'll do another another episode on (laughs) money and jobs. Part two. (laughs) Yeah. And that and being a parent and not feeling like you're shit at both and at the same time. And with two. That sounds like a load. with two. It's a bitch of a job. Thank you so much for coming on. You were amazing. I I know your story is going to be really helpful, you know, if not only for another gay couple that's going through this, I think... It's important for people who are in heterosexual relationships to hear about someone's story 
who has yeah. to deal with other factors and go through it. And it just makes everyone a better human to know yeah. about what other people are going through. Completely agree. If it's even like one person who like this resonates with, I'm down. So I really appreciate you just like giving us this platform and bringing me on. And I just love you so much. And thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to The Real Stuff. I'm Lucy Fink. Don't forget to follow the show on social media at The Real Stuff Pod. And if you're liking these episodes, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It helps the show so much. And if you're feeling called to come on the show, visit lucyfink.com slash apply and tell us your story. We'll see you next week for another intimate conversation on The Real Stuff.